Welcome to the discussion on ultrasound of abdominal vasculature. My name is Rich Gordon. I have no disclosures to make. In this presentation, we're going to review the abdominal vasculature anatomy. We're going to review the technique to acquire the sonographic images for the vascular anatomy. And we're going to review the technique for identification of periaortic lymphadenopathy. By the end of it, I hope you'll be able to acquire the sonographic images of the abdominal vasculature and, of course, be able to identify that vasculature. And this presentation really serves as a great prerequisite not only for the ultrasound evaluation of abdominal aortic aneurysm, but also general orientation when doing sonography of the abdomen. So here's some of the vasculature that we're going to review. Obviously, the aorta and the IVC and some of the major branches. Now, I think the best way to approach this is to break the major vasculature of the abdomen into three different parts. And we're going to start off with the proximal vasculature. And the major branches that we're going to focus on, on the venous side, would be the hepatic veins. And on the arterial side is going to be the celiac trunk, which further divides into the splenic artery and the common hepatic artery. Now we're also going to talk about the portal venous system, which could technically be a portion of the proximal vasculature of the abdomen, but it is a lot more superficial than the aorta and the IVC, and I feel like can be better discussed separate from this proximal vasculature. Now, to first acquire an image of the proximal vasculature, the probe is going to be placed in a transverse view with the probe indicator pointing to the patient's right. That's going to be the scanner's left. Next, you're going to have to not be bashful about applying some pressure to the probe to try to bring the scan surface closer to what you're actually trying to scan. Now, body habitus and bowel gas are clear limitations when it comes to doing abdominal vasculature sonography. But a lot of times, if you're patient and apply some pressure, you'll be able to acquire the images that you look for. Now, you can also have the patient relax their abdomen simply by asking them to do so, or have them bend their knees, which will also relax their rectus abdominis muscles. Now, applying pressure is going to be particularly important in the superior abdomen because at this location, the aorta is at its deepest position within the abdomen. As you go more caudal in the abdomen, the aorta becomes much more superficial, and the pressure that is required to visualize the aorta is much less. With regards to the proximal abdominal vasculature, when done right, you're going to get an image something like this. In all honesty, you may need to rock the back of the probe back towards the feet to aim the scan surface up under the costal margin to really get this image. And the first thing that you're going to look for is the hyperechoic portion of the anterior cortex of the vertebral body, which you can see right here, and then the corresponding shadow behind it. The significance of identifying the spine is it identifies your midline in most patients. And this is going to help you differentiate your aorta from your IVC. You can remember from basic anatomy that the aorta lays just to the patient's left of the midline, whereas the IVC lays just to the patient's right of the midline. So once you identify that midline, you know that the aorta is going to be just to the left of center. Now that we've identified the aorta, you may have to fan back and forth a little bit to get the celiac trunk taking off here, which further divides into the splenic artery and the common hepatic artery. And this has been affectionately called the seagull sign for obvious reasons. Now let's take a look at a video of this. Before we start the video, here's the anterior cortex of vertebral body and the corresponding shadow. Now that we know that, we know this must be the aorta, and this must be the inferior vena cava. And as the sonographer fans the probe, we can see right here is the celiac trunk, right there tying into the aorta, and then coming up and further dividing into the splenic artery, and the common hepatic artery. And you can see there briefly as the, fan, as the probe is fanned back and forth, the seagull sign. This is the inferior vena cava. This right here is the portal vein, which we'll talk more about later. Now let's focus on the middle abdominal vasculature. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the superior mesenteric artery, the left renal vein and artery, and the right renal vein and artery. Again, our key landmark is going to be the anterior cortex of the vertebral body. 
this hyperechoic line here with the corresponding shadow. Because the aorta is just to the left of midline, or in this case, really almost midline, we know this is the aorta, this is the inferior vena cava. Once we've identified these two structures, we can start identifying other vascular structures. This is going to be the superior mesenteric artery, the second major branch off of the aorta. And the superior mesenteric artery generally has a hyperechoic connective tissue that outlines it. And you can see that right here. Running between the superior mesenteric artery and the aorta is going to be your left renal vein. And we can see that moving between the aorta and the SMA right here. Now the left kidney is going to be somewhere over here. It is currently obscured by bowel gas. The renal arteries are often not clearly visible with abdominal sonography. You can see right here in this patient just the start of the right renal artery which actually dives behind the inferior vena cava and that's normal anatomy. The right renal artery goes behind the inferior vena cava. The left renal artery is not clearly visible here. And it's important for me to make the point that generally speaking the renal arteries are not going to be visualized with abdominal sonography. Your key landmark for the renal arteries is going to be the superior mesenteric artery which takes off of the aorta almost immediately before the renal arteries when going cephalad to caudal. Now let's take a video again to get oriented anterior cortex of the vertebral body corresponding shadow. This is the aorta. This is the inferior vena cava. We can see just a little bit of the celiac trunk as we start the video. We can see the superior mesenteric artery just take off right here and you can see the rim of hyperechoic tissue around that. We can see the left renal vein going between the SMA and the aorta. We see just a small cut of the left renal artery. Again, we're not going to be in a habit of actually trying to identify that. And we just saw go through the footage right here, the right renal artery going behind the inferior vena cava. We're going to talk more about this later, but just to talk about it while we're here, this is the splenic vein coming over to join the inferior mesenteric vein to form the portal confluence. And as that restarts, we'll identify that here. Here's the portal vein, splenic vein, and now the superior mesenteric vein because we're actually sliding caudal. Let's have another look here. Same vasculature that we're trying to identify. This footage rolls a little bit quicker. Celiac trunk. Now, superior mesenteric artery, left renal vein. Let's try to identify that again. There's the SMA right now, the left renal vein traversing between the aorta and the SMA. And let's take a look one last time. Now let's focus on the major distal abdominal vasculature. Now this one will be quite easy, and it's going to be the common iliac arteries and the common iliac veins. It's important to remember that the aorta generally bifurcates roughly at the level of the umbilicus. So if you are scanning below the umbilicus looking for the aorta, you're not going to find it. Now in this case, we're going to wind up immediately above the umbilicus. As this video starts, the probe is actually positioned in the epigastrum, and the sonographer is sliding down the abdomen. Here is the anterior cortex here of your vertebral body. Here is the aorta, and the IVC is right here. Now I want you to try to identify the major abdominal vasculature that we've identified so far, but I also want you to notice that the aorta will become more superficial as the sonologist slides the probe down the abdomen. Here's your aorta, becoming more superficial and bifurcating. It's rolling one more time, and bifurcation. One last time. Okay. Now let's talk about acquiring an image of the aorta in long axis. Now we've repositioned the probe in the epigastrum, but this time we've rotated 90 degrees clockwise with the probe indicator pointing towards the patient's head, and we're going to get a 
parallel view of the aorta and the proximal major vasculature. And you'll get a view that looks something like this. First going superficial to deep, you can see the liver right here. Next we can see the celiac trunk here and the superior mesenteric artery. Here is the aorta. And this right here is the anterior cortex of the vertebral body. And you can see right here actually intervertebral disc. This right here is the left renal vein. And this right here is actually periaortic lymphadenopathy. We're going to talk more about that later. Here's another view. We've got the liver here. Here is a long axis image of the aorta. We can see the celiac trunk coming up. And then we can see one of the branches right here, likely the common hepatic artery, but it's a little bit difficult to tell from this angle. Here's the superior mesenteric artery. And again, here's the anterior cortex of the spine with intervertebral disc. Now let's go back to the top and take a look at the hepatic veins. So the probe is now back transverse relative to the body with the probe indicator point at the patient's right. You'll likely have to slightly position the probe just to the patient's right and rock the probe back to turn the scan surface to look up underneath the costal margin to acquire this view. Obviously your key landmark here is going to be the liver. And in the extreme posterior aspect of the liver, you'll see the IVC traversing. As you continue to fan this probe back to look up under the costal margin, you'll start to see the hepatic veins all converge onto the IVC. This is going to be the left hepatic vein. This is the middle hepatic vein traveling through the median longitudinal fissure. And here's the right hepatic vein. Now we're doing a long axis view of the IVC. The probe has again been rotated 90 degrees clockwise of the probe indicator point to the patient's head. Here is our liver, right here. And this is going to be the inferior vena cava, right here. We know it's the inferior vena cava because I can see where the hepatic veins are actually entering into the IVC. Also, too, if you note right here, this small dot posterior to the IVC, this is going to be the right renal artery. If you recall, we discussed the right renal artery goes posterior to the IVC. Let's talk about an important point, and that's being able to identify the IVC from the aorta. It's not always as easy as you might think. The way that I like to identify the IVC is have the probe indicator pointed towards the patient's head with the scan surface placed square in the middle of the epigastrum, and I'd like to identify the liver. What I then do is just slightly fan the probe so the scan surface is looking over to the patient's right. So I'll rock the probe this way, scanning off to the patient's right, until I see that hepatic vein run down to the IVC. And we can see the IVC right here. And you can see that in this particular case, the IVC is quite collapsible with respiratory variation. However, it's important to understand that the IVC diameter is highly variable from patient to patient depending upon their fluid status, right heart function, or whether they're being ventilated with positive pressure ventilation. It's not uncommon to see a large plethoric pulsatile IVC, which can easily be confused with the aorta. Do not rely on pulsatility of the IVC to differentiate between the aorta and the IVC. It's very important for you to see that hepatic vein traverse the liver going into the IVC. Additionally, you can see the right atrium right here. Now, alternatively, when identifying the inferior vena cava, you can start off in a short axis view relative to the body with the probe rocked back up under the costal margin, scanning up towards the heart. And this is quite simply a subcostal four chamber view of the heart. Here is the right atrium. As we stand that probe up, you'll scan down and see the IVC where the hepatic veins are all converging on the IVC. All you have to do again is follow that right atrium down. We know that the right atrium is an extension of the inferior vena cava. Then you can rotate on that and get an image of your IVC. Once you identify your IVC in short axis in the middle of the screen, simply rotate the probe clockwise 90 degrees, maintaining the IVC in view, 
and your long axis view will drop in and you can see again hepatic confluence right here here's another nice view here's the IVC here's the hepatic vein coming down to converge onto the IVC here's the right atrium here's another view now in this case you can see that there is not a lot of variability in IVC diameter as compared to the previous images and you can see it varies from patient to patient here's your IVC here is the hepatic vein coming down to converge onto the IVC and the right atrium is located just above the liver here so with what we just reviewed can you tell which structure is the IVC and which structure is the aorta well this is your aorta here and we know that because we see the major proximal branches of the aorta. We can see the celiac trunk here, and we can see the SMA. We know this is the IVC because we see the hepatic confluence right here. It's very important to identify the major branches to help differentiate between the IVC and the aorta. Now let's go back and talk about some more superficial abdominal vasculature, specifically the portal venous system. If you recall, the portal vein is formed out of the confluence between the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein. Also, the inferior mesenteric vein is a major contributor as well. And then the portal vein will travel up to the porta pattis before it eventually branches in to the left and right portal vein. So let's get a look at that here. Now we're starting at the superior portion of the abdomen. The probe indicator is pointed to the patient's right, giving us a short axis view of the body. This right here is the inferior vena cava at the point of the portal confluence. We can see, you'll see as we start the video, the hepatic veins converging on the IVC. There they are. IVC, as we come down, this is the branching of the portal vein. Here is the portal vein right here splenic vein coming over the top, superior mesenteric vein. Just focus on this part right here. Portal vein right here, superior mesenteric vein, and you see the splenic vein come over the top. This will restart now. Here's your portal veins up here. Following it down, there's the splenic vein superior mesenteric vein, back up to the portal vein. Now note the, the hepatic veins and the portal veins can be differentiated by the wall thickness. Look at the portal veins here. You can see this bright white echo texture around it. That was actually the base of the gallbladder. Right here. Thick walled. The portal vein is a thick walled structure, whereas the hepatic vein is extremely thin walled. Here's a hepatic vein, see? Portal vein right here, very thick walled. Also note that the portal veins tend to traverse the liver in a horizontal fashion, whereas the hepatic veins tend to run in a vertical fashion. So that's actually, if you focus on this structure right here, that's actually a hepatic vein right there. There's a hepatic vein, hepatic vein, portal vein traversing here. Portal vein again traverses horizontal and is a thick walled vascular structure whereas the hepatic vein is a thin walled structure that tends to run in a vertical fashion through the liver. Now we're going to change gears and talk a little bit about periaortic lymph nodes. You will see this from time to time and it's important to know that enlarged periaortic lymph nodes are non-specific and have to be considered with the clinical picture of that patient. It can be enlarged again for various reasons. That may be malignancies, and that's different types of malignancies, lymphoma, gastric cancer, pancreatic cancer, and various pelvic cancers, including cervical cancer and ovarian cancer. There can be other infectious ideologies, including HIV and extrapulmonary tuberculosis, also inflammatory bowel diseases, sarcoid, and systemic lupus erythematosus. Now let's take a look at some of the images of periodic lymph nodes. We already know how to get oriented with abdominal vasculature. Here's the anterior cortex or vertebral body. And here is the corresponding vertebral body shadow. We know that the aorta is in the midline or just slightly to the left of the midline. 
IVC is going to be somewhere to the right of the midline because the still picture is difficult to tell. But we see right off the bat various hypoechoic lesions around the aorta. You can see one right here, one right here, one right here, one right here. These are all periaortic lymph nodes. As we start the video, you can see that as we slide up and down, they effectively wink at you because they are spherical structures. And as the scan plane traverses that lymph node, they come in plane and then out of plane, kind of giving a winking appearance. All of the right here is a lymph node, lymph node, lymph node. Now what we've done is acquired a long axis view of the aorta. And again, we can see periaortic lymph nodes. Here is the aorta, superior mesenteric artery. This is the left renal vein, but here is a lymph node here, more lymph nodes up here. And this demonstrates what we call the banana peel view of the aorta. And a lot of times when you look at periaortic lymph nodes, you can see a lymph node squeezed between the SMA and the aorta. And oftentimes it'll even affect the trajectory of the SMA giving, rather than kind of an oblique takeoff, giving almost a vertical takeoff as the lymph nodes grow. It actually pushes that superior mesenteric artery into more of a vertical trajectory. This would be a great time to review some of the anatomy that we've already been through and maybe even add a couple more structures. This is the liver right here. This structure right here that's folded down on itself, this is actually the stomach. The structure here is the pancreas that is quite visible on this ultrasound image. The structure right here is your portal vein. And as you follow it down, here is the superior mesenteric vein. Portal vein again, coming down to superior mesenteric vein. Now here is an, an extreme case of periaortic lymphadenopathy and mesenteric lymphadenopathy. This right here is the anterior cortex of the vertebral body. And you can see right here and right here, some intervertebral disc. Here, 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 all throughout widespread periaortic lymphadenopathy. You can see an abdominal vascular structure here. At this point, it's difficult to tell what exactly that is because the anatomy is so distorted by all the periaortic lymphadenopathy. I hope you enjoyed the discussion on abdominal vasculature. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at the email on the screen. And I look forward to seeing you in future lectures of the basic point of care ultrasound lecture series. Mm -hmm.